Hello, my friends, and welcome to Fishery. I'm Alexander Williamson, your host, as always, on the channel. And today we're talking about pH. We're talking about GH. We're talking about KH. We're talking about TDS. Praise the Lord. All right, you guys, these are some really important topics. And you may be thinking, Alex, I already know all about TDS, KH, GH, PH. Uh, boring. I'm going to skip this episode. But I want you to know that it is a logarithmic scale. So if you get a bucket of water from the gods, from the heavens, from rain, and you set it down, and it has a 7.0 completely neutral pH from the get, and you put it on the ground, the bucket on the ground, about 75 degree weather, normal day, did you know that that bucket's going to go all the way down to probably 4, 5, 6 uh, in its acidity? It is not going to stay at 7.0. Water that's acidic is rowdy, and you actually need to use your KH or your carbonate hardness in order to buffer that water to prevent it from becoming active and acidic. So beyond that, if that's a bit of a surprise, here's another little piece that if you didn't know this, definitely stay tuned for the rest of these explanations. If you have a fish in water at 6.0 pH, and you put a drop per million of ammonia in there, it's not a problem. That ammonia will evaporate off. It turns into ammonium, and it totally evaporates up and out without being a problem. Anything under 6.4, it'll evaporate out of that acidic water because that water's rowdy, it's moving around, it's trying to do things, and the ammonia becomes ammonium, and it breaks free, and it evaporates out. However, if you're at, say, 8.0, and you put that same dropper of ammonia in, did you know that it's a hundred times more deadly than it would be at 6.0? Because ammonia from 6.0 to 7.0, it's 10 times more powerful. And from 6.0 to 8.0, it's a hundred times more powerful because it's a logarithmic scale. Scale It goes up exponentially. And so it's like a roller coaster, a rocket taking off to the moon. And very quickly, you can kill a lot of fish if you don't understand this. So if you're keeping Rift Lake cichlids or you're keeping guppies or hard water fish that are in very alkaline water that's buffered very well, that ammonia is going to be far more deadly to them. Also, in that acidic tank, anything below around 6.2 or so, you're not gonna have your aerobic uh, bacteria working to do the nitrogen cycle. It becomes uncycled. There's no ammonia for it to process. Now, there are different nitrogen pathways, but that's something for another video. So let's jump in and talk about this thing. And first of all, I want to demystify if you ever see KH versus DKH, what's going on there. So if you see KH or GH, you think that that's, you know, carbonate hardness or general hardness, right? Well, when you see GH without a D, that's the American system. That's a system a lot of people around the world use. And it's usually in parts per million or PPM. If it's in parts per billion, then it's in PPB and they'll write that. But in Germany, where they came up with this system around the turn of the century, they had a term for degrees of hardness. And it happened to be that they weren't using parts per million and they weren't using uh, gallons or liters or whatnot, they were using a different ratio based on elemental masses. And it so turns out that if it says degrees of carbonate hardness, that's actually 17.9 parts per million. So if you see DKH of four or five, when you're looking at the specs on say, uh, something like a Caradina shrimp that needs fairly soft water, but it needs a little bit of KH or carbonate hardness to build its exoskeleton, so you see the KH and you see, okay, it says KH of four or five. But if it says that, it's probably saying a DKH. And what that is, is it means you need to multiply that by 17.9 or 18. And you'll see something like if it was one DKH, it'll be 18 parts per million. If you see two, it's going to be 36 parts per million, so on and so forth. So make sure to do the conversion of either multiplying or dividing if you're transferring amounts, if you're reading in parts per million and you're transferring it to a test kit that's a little vial that's in DKH, a lot of times the dropper kits, when you uh, put to, to find out the KH or the GH, you'll drop a certain amount of a reagent into a vial. And that happens after a certain amount of drops, which then translates to 
the number of KH or GH. And this is partially why that's also there is because otherwise it'd be some crazy big specific number and we want to keep it workable. So just remember that. Okay, so back a step to pH. pH is how acidic or how basic something is. Basic also has the term of alkalinity. And I'm doing this on either side of me because neutral is the center of the scale. Only the number 7.0 is completely neutral. 14 is very, very alkaline. That's as alkaline or as basic as it can get. In the fish tank world, you probably won't ever see anything over 8.5 to 9, but know that it goes all the way to 14. On the other hand, we do have fish that live in quite acidic water. And if 7 is neutral or completely rainwater with no buffering capacity, nothing floating around minerality-wise in it, just pure water that just fell, every unit you go up or down this scale is logarithmic. So if I go down to 6.0, that is 10 times more acidic than 7.0. If I go to 5.0, that is 100 times more acidic. And if I go to 4, that's going to be 1,000 times. So each time, it's 10 times the last. It's a logarithmic scale. So it gets very intense very quickly. And the curve on that is like a giant, giant bell curve, depending on how you want to look at it. But just know that, that the acidity... An acidity of one is like burn through your skin. And same with base. That can burn all your skin too if it's at 13. Versus 10 is not that harmful. It's still pretty basic, but it's not that harmful. And say that a three is like a Coca-Cola versus battery acid at one. But almost everything in the aquarium will be around 5.5 to 8.5 with seven being neutral. And every fish is going to want a different level of pH. Now, generally, if you stay somewhere in the 6.5 to 7.5, you're going to be in that window that most fish in our aquarium hobby can tolerate. Now, there are some things like licorice garamis or catfish or like little sundadanios or certain tetras and things that may want far more acidic water. And to get them to breed, you may really need very acidic water. And that's why knowing these things is also important beyond just basic care, is if you want to get into breeding and spawning fish, a lot of these things are triggers. The KH, the GH, the TDS, you know, all of these things are important. Now, water itself is a polar molecule. And so it's going to want to atomically or molecularly get together with different things and basically uh, connect up. And when you're on the acidic scale, that can mean that the water is not buffered. And that's why your bucket of water can drop in acidity. Because as water's just sitting there, it wants to link up. It wants to smash into other water molecules. It, the hydrogen breaks free sometimes. Not just boiling water has water leaving and breaking free elementally. Both the molecules evaporate at room temperature, at any temperature, uh, above absolute zero, and uh, they do it more and more when they're being boiled, but they do it and they move and they get pulled around and they jostle and they twitch, just being molecules. And so for this, we're not going to get into it super deep. When you add KH or carbonate hardness, and it's with a K and not a C, because it's German originally. The, it's German and Swiss that were inventing this system at the turn of the 19th into the 20th century. And so we've inherited the acronym from them and we didn't want to switch it around and say CH, carbonate hardness. We left it KH. Anyways, that's what that's about. And basically your carbonate hardness is your bicarbonates or your carbonates in your water, your KH. And that is your buffering capacity. Some people explain it as a trash can and they say that it's basically like the more of a trash can you have or the more KH you have, the more stable your water is, the less likely it is to become acidic and to jostle around and to act crazy and become very, very acidic or to evaporate off or to bond chemically with different things uh, to make, for instance, the ammonia evaporate off quicker. But I like to think of it as a life vest. 
So your KH is like a little outfit or life vest that goes over your water molecule. And you can have your negative or your positive water molecules on either side, but your KH is going to buffer that and stop them from acting up. And so if you have a little bit of KH, it's like a t-shirt. If you have a lot of KH, it's like a straight jacket and they're not gonna do anything. So if you have enough KH, it's gonna lock up that water and keep it completely still as far as pH goes. And that's a good way to think of it because if you have a little bit of uh, KH and some of that water is still able to be in a t-shirt and break free and act up, it can then go down and say you're getting your KH from crushed coral, bones, or some sort of cuddle bone, uh, something like that is what we use in the aquarium hobby. And it will actually use the acidity in the water to melt that and it breaks more of the KH free and then that KH then surrounds those water cells and locks them up. So over time, even though if it becomes more acidic, that's the tendency of the water, it will break some of that KH free and use it. So over time, you will deplete the buffer of the KH in your aquarium and you need to add more. So that's why we add crushed coral to our aquariums or to our substrate over time, or we add drops of something or equilibrium or scoops of a powder is for that. Now, KH, we just explained, GH is your general hardness or your minerality hardness, your calcium hardness, uh, which would be really confusing, and that's also why we don't do CH. It's your calcium hardness, not your carbonate hardness. And this tells you things like the conductivity of the water for a whole number of reasons, but also it tells you that you know your snails, your shrimp, your exoskeletons, your bones, and even your basic neurological signals that fire in fish, in us, electrolytes, magnesium, manganese, all those things are linked to your uh, calcium uh, hardness or your calcium levels. And same thing with the 17.9. It can either be degrees of calcium hardness or, or basically we call it general hardness, so GH, or it can be DGH or it can be just GH and then it'll say parts per million afterwards. And it's that same 17.9 parts per million equals one degree in that German unit system. Okay, so I hope that clears that up a little bit. And you can kind of guess that from your general hardness or your calcium hardness, if you want to think of it that way, you actually have magnesium, manganese, zinc, all these other things, potassium, uh, that are likely in the water as well. Not for sure, but likely in nature are going to be there as well, these trace minerals and these salts. Um, whereas your carbonate, your KH, is just going to tell you about the carbonates and bicarbonates. Now, your TDS, your total dissolved solids, is something completely separate from your pH, your KH, or your GH. It is everything that has dissolved in your water. It doesn't tell you anything about the pH if your water is alkaline or if it is acidic. Now, if your TDS, your total dissolved solids, is absolutely zero, there's nothing in the water, you can make a pretty safe guess that that water is either neutral or slightly acidic uh, based on that. That's all you know though, and that's only if your TDS is zero. As it goes up, you could have 100 parts per million, uh, you could have 500 parts per million, and we call this our water hardness. And this is very similar to the, uh, the general hardness in that it gives us a good idea that there's going to be all these other dissolved elements and or compounds. There may be iron that's dissolved and oxygenated and floating around in little, uh, little atomic parts or little molecules in our water, and that's your dissolved minerality that you're seeing. But whatever it may be that you're seeing, that goes into TDS. And you can guess that if it's a high TDS, that it probably does have some of the KH and some of the GH but you don't know for sure. Now, if you know your area and your water, your tap water or the water in say the Amazon or the Congo River or the Mekong River, wherever you may live, you may know that when the TDS is 400 parts per million, that usually means that you have a DKH of four and a DGH of say eight. 
And you may just know that from being able to guess the total minerality, but that's not something that holds true across all water. All it tells you is that when you, uh, you subtract your parts per million of uh, ammonia or nitrogen or nitrates, nitrites, when you take your test kit and you see how many there are parts per million, you can subtract that. If you have an iron test kit or a phosphate test kit, you can subtract that. And then your KH and your GH, you can subtract that. And then you know <laughs> that your TDS is something other than whatever the things you tested for are. And you can realize that in parts per million, you've got dissolved some element in that leftover water. So it's not super useful, but it does tell us that uh, water that's very soft generally doesn't have a lot of buffering capacity, doesn't have a lot of KH or GH usually. And usually if you have very soft water, you're gonna wanna add some crushed coral to act as those kind of uh, straight jackets or those uh, bulletproof vests that kind of hold tight your water molecules and stop them from reacting with everyone around them. They kind of insulate them. And your GH, that's something that's important for building of plants and building of uh, signals and uh, neurological things in all life forms as well. And so the conductivity being there is somewhat important too, and it's generally linked in some way to the KH, but there's no set rule for that, which is frustrating. But that's how pH, KH, GH, and TDS work. I hope that that helps untangle a bit of this. I can't do it without you, without you guys liking, sharing, subscribing. And if I've explained it in a way that was helpful to you, uh, share it with someone who may be having trouble with this or maybe new at this. Maybe they're old at this and it's just a way to make it click a little differently. That's the goal here is just to learn and to teach one another. And that goes for all animals, cats to catfish. My kitty cat has been at my feet this entire time. So I guess she wants to say hello or wants to jump on my shoulder. Um, so uh, I, uh, bye.